we saw in one of our first labs that we could actually move this thing back and forth to create a wave that repeats itself. Now this wave is actually called a standing wave. Standing wave does not necessarily mean that you're standing up, it just means that the wave continues to repeat itself back and forth. Now if you did this the other day in, in that first lab, you probably found that the wave actually kind of fought you, the slinky kind of fought you at the beginning, but then once you found that frequency, be it this be the lowest frequency I can do, I can really get the wave to kind of just perpetuate itself. Now if you look here, one of the things that's really important and that you probably noticed is that wave is huge. Look at the amplitude in the middle there. But at the same time, look at how far I'm moving my hand. I'm only moving my hand back and forth like this, but the wave is huge. So I'm adding very little energy, but the wave is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the key to a standing wave. Alright, so how does a standing wave stuff work? Well, as it turns out, it brings into account all of the things that we've learned so far. Let's start from the beginning. Let's say that I send a pulse down this way towards a fixed end on the wall. So this is a fixed end on the wall. What's going to happen when that pulse comes back? Well, we learned that if you have a fixed end, it comes back out of phase, which means that pulse is going to be returned out of phase, just like this. Well, as it so happens, that right behind this pulse, I actually made another pulse that looks like this. So what does that look like? Well, when this hits this wall, it's going to bounce back out of phase. So it's going to be coming out of phase like this. Well, at the same time, we're a half a period later, this wave is going to be where? Well, it's also going to be moving towards the wall right there. Now these two waves are actually now in phase. So what do we get if we have two waves that are superimposed on one another that are in phase? We get super wave. This is the addition of the two amplitudes. We have the incident wave, the wave that's going into the wall, and the reflected wave, the wave that's coming back. Those two are superimposed on each other and you get super wave. Okay? Now let's go a half a, um, actually let's uh, add some more waves here. Let's put another, these are waves that I'm putting on here. We'll just go like this. We've got wave one, we'll call it wave two, we'll call it wave three, we'll call it wave four. So these are actually pulses one, two, three, and four. So here I've got pulse one that's being reflected. Pulse two is still incident upon the wall and they actually, uh, Combine. Pulse 3 and 4 are still going into the wall. This would be pulse 3, this would be pulse 4, 3 is on the top, 4 is on the bottom. Let's look another half a wavelength later. A half a wavelength later, pulse 1 is going to be here. So it's going to be here, there's 1. Pulse 2 is going to hit the wall and reflect back. So pulse 2 is going to be up here. Where's pulse 3? Well, pulse 3, half a period later, is going to be on top of pulse 2, which makes super wave over here. So we have pulse 2 coming back, pulse 3 going in, so we get super wave right here, constructive interference. Where's pulse 4? Well, as it turns out, pulse 4, 1 is going back this way, pulse 4 is going that way, he's now here. So three moved to there, one moved to here, four moved to there. So we now also have super wave down here as well. With pulse one going back and pulse four going in. So we have again constructive interference between the incident wave, the wave going in, and the reflected wave. These we call antinodes 
are big uh, displacements of the slinky, or big displacements of the wave, due to constructive interference of the incident and the reflected wave. Now let's talk about what happens in between here. So at some point, let's go here, at some point, one going this way is going to hook up with three going that way. Now one is a negative displacement here, three is a positive displacement there. So they're actually going to hit at this point right here. Now what happens when you have a negative wave here and a positive displacement up there, positive amplitude up there? They're going to get destructive interference. So at this point right here, one going that way and three going that way are going to destructively interfere. This point in the slinky is not going to move because one and three have canceled each other out at that point. Another half a wavelength later, two is going to come up around here on the top, four is going to be going that way. So two and four are going to cancel each other out at that point. This point does not move. We call that a node. So what we end up with is we end up with a standing wave. We end up with a wave that has constructive and destructive interference. We end up with something that looks like this. Here's my wall, and then uh, the wave goes like this. These are called anti-nodes, and these are called nodes. This is a standing wave. This is what happens when uh, uh, ladies kind of try to sing and they break the glass. What they do is they, they uh, are adding energy every time, but that wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally breaks. This is actually called resonance. That's a word you should know. Resonance. So the idea behind resonance is that you're adding energy at the right time. And if you were doing this with the slinky, you probably found that the slinky stopped fighting you. And you could just move your hand back and forth slightly, but the wave got really big. A good example of resonance would be pushing my daughter in a swing. So if I want to push her in a swing, here's what I do. I give her a little push, she goes up, she comes back. Then I give her a little bigger push, or another little push, and she goes a little higher, and she comes back. And then I give her another push, and she goes higher. And she goes higher and higher and higher if I add energy. But I have to add energy at the right time. It has to be perfectly synced. If I push her, and she's going up, and then as she's starting to come back, I push her again, she's not going to go higher. It's not going to actually create that resonant effect. So resonance is a huge thing in music. It's a huge thing in uh, speakers uh, in terms of they, they create speakers with the back, actually the back of the speaker, the, the wooden part of the speaker is a certain distance away so they can get resonance frequencies in there and make the thing bigger. That's how a guitar actually works is that the body of the guitar is a certain size in order to get a resonant frequency. Violins, all those kinds of things. Let's take a look a little bit more and see if we can't figure out how we use this uh, in an investigation. Let me show you a couple demonstrations about how this works. So first off, I've got this tube. This is just a vacuum tube that uh, has got a hole on either side. And if I swing this really fast, I want you to listen to what happens. You hear that sound? What's happening is really, really loud. That's because I get a standing wave set up inside this. Now the longest standing wave I can get would look something like this. Okay? This is called the fundamental frequency. This is the longest wave or the lowest frequency that I can get. We call it the fundamental. Now I can actually set up, just like I can do on a slinky, I can set up higher frequency uh, waves. And so, uh, you can listen like this. So you probably heard a couple of different tones on that. So I had my fundamental frequency was the lowest tone I could do. But when I made it go faster, it was just like kind of moving that slinky faster. I can make a different wave inside. So the first higher frequency I can make is actually called the first 
harmonic. Uh, or actually it's called the second harmonic. The first harmonic is the, the fundamental frequency. The second harmonic, uh, it's also called the first overtone. So we either call it the fundamental frequency, first overtone, or the first and the second harmonic. It looks like this. So you can see it's also a standing wave. I'm putting in an anti-note in one side, I'm getting an anti-note out the other. If you note, I can only make certain waves in this, certain tones in this thing, because it only has a certain length. Um, I can make these different octaves, or I can make these different harmonics with different fundamental or different uh, overtones of that fundamental frequency. Now, if I could change the length of this thing, then I would be able to make different waves. This is actually what happens in a, uh, a trombone. A trombone, you set up, you put in an anti note on one side, it comes out the other, but uh, then you change the length of the trombone to make different frequency waves. Let me show you kind of how that works. I have a uh, trombone uh, mouthpiece here. And if I blow into this, now I, I'm not a music guy, I'm gonna tell you that right up front. I played the cornet for a year and a half in seventh grade, but I can buzz in this thing. In order to make uh, sound in a trumpet or a brass instrument, uh, you have to buzz your lips like that. Like, a, like that. And in fact, if you listen to that, it doesn't sound very good. It's uh, a very low tone. That's because you can't set up a uh, standing wave in this. The, the wavelength of sound is somewhere around a meter, it's somewhere in here. And so I can't set up a standing wave inside this thing. It's not long enough. But what if I change the length of this? If I take, I got a garden hose here. So I'm gonna shove this inside one side of this garden hose. And the other side, I don't know, I'll put something else on there. Um, I'll just put this funnel on here to kind of make the sound a little bigger. If I put this on here like this, I want you to listen to what happens. Does that sound a little better? That actually sounds a lot like a trumpet. This is a trumpet. I think I can get this stuck in here a little better maybe. Here we go. I'm gonna kink in my hose. So if I take this, it's actually more like a trombone. Listen. This is a trombone. It's just a long thing that I can set up a standing wave inside. And I can actually make different frequencies of my standing wave with this. And I can play certain notes. If you play, say, a trumpet, you would know that in order to play, I think it's a C, you just leave the valves open. If you want to play a high C, you still leave the valves open. You just uh, uh, make your uh, lips go a little bit quicker. This is how standing waves work. You have a standing wave in here, and then you change the length of this by either pressing some valves to make the air go through different paths in your trumpet or your French horn or whatever you're doing, or you lengthen and shorten it uh, like in a trombone. Okay, in fact, with a trumpet, I think you lengthen and shorten it in order to tune it. So standing waves are used a ton in music. These are known as open uh, tubes. It's open on one end, open on the other. It's a little bit different with a closed tube. All right, let's take a look at some of this vocabulary here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at three different methods of creating sound and how these different vocabulary terms uh, fit into both or all three. So here we go, I'm gonna start with a string. A string, the fundamental frequency on a string would look like this. You've got two nodes on the end and you've got an anti-node in the middle. This is as long of a wavelength as you can get in a string. So in this case, the length of this, the length of this is equal to uh, wavelength over two. This is half of a wavelength. The distance from this side to this side is half of a wavelength, because if you were to continue this a full wavelength, it would look like that. So that's half of a wavelength. We call this the fundamental frequency. So this is the fundamental. It's also called the first harmonic. 
Those are two kind of vocabulary terms that you're going to run into. If I go to the next standing wave that I can make on a string, it's going to look like this, which then looks like this. So you can see this is a full wavelength. This is actually a full wavelength. L is equal to a full wavelength. We call that the, or the second harmonic or the first overtone. It's over the fundamental, uh, and it's the second harmonic. Uh, moving up from there, you know, you get, you know, this is uh, one and a half wavelengths, three over two wavelengths, um, which is then the uh, second overtone or the third harmonic. Now, if you're a music person, these are actually octaves. That's how octaves work. This is how things work in a string, and you can move up from there. If you actually look at a string uh, as it's uh, being plucked on a guitar, say, uh, it may have a couple of these different uh, overtones on it. Uh, the string actually may have like a long uh, wave like this, but then on top of that, it may have another wave uh, you know, that the string's actually moving on. And that's really if you look at the body of the guitar. The body of the, car, the guitar is vibrating at the same way all six strings are vibrating. So it is a superposition of all of those which makes the actual tone that comes out. When you sing, some of you sang uh, into Audacity in that first lab, and you, it wasn't a perfect wave. That's because your voice uh, has different tones and overtones in it as well. Tubes. A open tube is going to look like this. This is actually the, you put in a uh, uh, antinode, you get out an antinode. So this again, the length of the tube is actually uh, half of a wavelength. And this again is called the fundamental frequency or the first harmonic. Okay, that's the longest, lowest tone you can play in that tube. Uh, if you go up from there, you know, you're going to get here. This is actually one wavelength, uh, which is, again is the uh, first overtone or the second harmonic, etc., etc., etc. It actually follows the exact same pattern that a string does. The pictures are just a little different. This is called an open tube. Now, a closed tube is a little different. A closed tube, you have a fixed end on this side. So when the wave comes in, it hits that fixed end and then it comes out the other side. And so you can put in a antinode and get out an antinode. But look at how much of a wavelength this is. The length here is the wavelength over four. It's a fourth of a wavelength. So you can actually have with a closed tube, you can be smaller. This would be like blowing into a, a pop bottle or something like that. This would be a closed tube. Uh, if you look at the first harmonic, uh, it would look something like this, which is actually three-fourths of a wavelength. And you go up a half of a wavelength every time, just like you did before. But it starts differently. This one starts at one-fourth, not at one-half. Today's investigation, we're going to use closed tubes to calculate the speed of sound. In today's investigation, we're actually going to calculate the speed of sound. And in order to calculate the speed of sound, we need two things. We need to know a frequency, and we need to know a wavelength. If you take frequency times wavelength, you get the speed of sound. So here's how we're actually going to do this. The frequency, we're going to use a tuning fork. Now I have a tuning fork here, and what's nice about the tuning forks is the frequency is written directly on it. This is 384 hertz, which must be a G. And if I play this tuning fork, you probably can't hear it very well, because it's a pretty low thing. It doesn't move a lot of air. There's not a lot of uh, amplitude to this. So what I have here is I have a way to find the wavelength. So I have a, uh, this is just a large uh, graduated cylinder, and I put a piece of PVC in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a wave down this PVC. There's water in this tube. So if I raise this up or lower this, I can adjust the length of the tube. That's really all this does, is allow the wave's going to go through this tube, hit the water, and bounce back. This is known as a fixed end or a, uh, um, a closed tube. So we would call this a closed tube. The wave's going to go down, hit the water, and then come back. 
So as it turns out, the uh, wavelength of this, or actually the, the, the standing wave that gets set in this, does not start with half of a wavelength like it does in an open tube. You put in an anti-node, you get out an anti-node. This is a fixed end. So in a fixed end, it comes back uh, in reverse, and so actually it's a fourth of a wavelength. The distance from here to there would be a fourth of a wavelength if I can get a standing wave set up. So here's what you gotta do in this lab. You gotta listen very closely for a change in amplitude or a change in loudness. And once you hit that standing wave, it'll actually get fairly loud. Let's see if I can get this to work. So you can hear it's pretty soft. You hear that? That's not good. That's not good. Right there is where the amplitude gets bigger. So this distance from the water to here is actually a fourth of a wavelength. So if I take that times four, now I have the wavelength. If I have the wavelength and the frequency, I can get the speed of sound. That's what we're gonna do today in the lab. You're gonna use a couple of different tuning forks uh, in order to figure out the speed of sound a couple of different times in a couple of different trials. Uh, compare that to what the speed of sound should be considering the temperature of the room and it's somewhere around 343. Uh, and then you can actually see uh, how close we get. So using resonance here, we're gonna calculate the speed of sound.